Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. You are kindly asked to take your seats, please. The 14th plenary meeting of the 11th emergency special session of the General Assembly is called to order. The General Assembly will continue its consideration of the agenda item five, entitled, I quote, letter dated on 28th of February, 2014, from the permanent representative of Ukraine to the United Nations, addressed to the President of the Security Council, S slash 2014 slash 136, end of quote. We are continuing the debate, and now I give the floor uh, to the distinguished representative of Canada. Mr. President, fellow delegates, we meet again in, in this resumed emergency special session for one reason and one reason only, and that is because the Russian Federation continues to violate international law and specifically Articles 1 and 2 of the UN Charter. Through its illegal actions in Ukraine, Russia is showing us that it is not a partner interested in peace or justice in Ukraine or elsewhere. Once again, as it has in recent months, it falls upon us, the members of the General Assembly, to defend the Charter and everything that the United Nations stands for. The draft resolution before us is tabled in response to Russia's attempts to illegally and forcibly annex more of Ukraine's territory. The resolution reaffirms the principle that borders and boundaries cannot be changed without consent that is freely given. It reaffirms the principle that might does not make right. And we call upon every member of this assembly to vote in favor of the resolution. Canada unequivocally condemns the so-called referenda by the Russian Federation in the illegally occupied regions of Donetsk, Lukansk, Kherson, and Zaporizhia in Ukraine. These are yet another blatant violation of international law by the Russian Federation. Millions have been either killed or wounded or forcibly displaced by this war of Russian aggression. The latest barrage of missile attacks against civilian infrastructure in Kyiv and cities that Russia now claims as its own through its sham referenda, reveal to all of us to see. It's apparent. It's, it's there, the true nature of this war. This is not a special military operation. It is a war to punish and ultimately to destroy Ukraine. We all know, everyone in our heart of hearts knows, every country knows, that an election that is held at the barrel of a gun can be neither free nor fair. We know that. We know that when someone points a gun at your head and tells you you must vote, we know it's not free and we know it's not fair. Yet President Putin has claimed that these so-called referenda reflect what he calls the will of the people in these illegally occupied territories, that they were somehow miraculously in two days after being called, two days after being called, that they're being carried out in line with democratic standards. He's alleged that they are somehow consistent with the UN Charter, as if the UN Charter means nothing. The reality is, is that 
Nothing could be further from the truth than what the President has said. This is illegal invasion. It is illegal occupation. It is illegal annexation, all at gunpoint, not democracy. Les actions de la Fédération de Russie. The Russian Federation's actions clearly violate the United Nations Charter and customary principles of international law. According to these, no acquisition of territory by the threat or the use of force can be recognized as legitimate. These fundamental principles to which we all adhere and the sovereign equality of all states and the settlement of disputes by peaceful means and the abstention from the use or the threat of the use of force have never been so threatened as they are today. Here in the corridors of the United Nations, we often speak about precedent. We must not allow another tyrannical precedent in the invasion and annexation overcome our respect for the primacy of law. We cannot allow the Security Council to which we have given the res primary responsibility for the maintenance of international peace and security to be fully paralyzed by one permanent member that clearly and publicly aspires to subjugating another state. We are convinced that the majority of countries represented in the assembly are of the same view, not just the Western countries or Eastern countries. These are the countries coming from all over the world. And this afternoon, we will see how far it is countries from the whole world that are rejecting the policy declared by President Putin. This last attempt by President Putin, uh, Putin to seize land in the Ukraine is at a scale that has never, never been seen since the Second World War. The annexed territory, illegally annexed by the Russian Federation, extends for more than 109,000 square kilometers. This is larger than the territory of three Canadian provinces, and we are a, a geographical giant. It's larger than more than half of the UN member states have within their internationally recognized borders. And it's about the same size as those of the three Baltic states, which were illegally annexed by Stalin in 1940. We must remember this because following the occupation of the three Baltic states by the Soviet army, the participation in the elections of new constitutive assemblies reached these crazy levels of 99.6% in 1940 following the invasion and annexation by the government of Stalin. Now, this figure, 89%, this ironically and strangely resembles the outcome of the so-called referenda, which have been held in the illegally occupied regions of the Ukraine, which Russia has attempted to annex, Mr. President. The imperial hab habits last a long time, and President Putin is trying to bring back the imperial past to Russia by invading and occupying and annexing and subjugating. If these gestures do not convince us, his words are very clear. We should read them because President Putin speaks publicly of his determination to reconstruct the Russian Empire through any means possible and to absorb the citizens of free and independent and sovereign states of the former Soviet Union, whether they like it or not. However, President Putin and the representatives of the Russian Federation in this hall have the audacity to say that they are operating in line with the United Nations Charter and International Law. 
They say that this is a anti-colonial project. No, Mr. President, absolutely not. On the contrary, the reality and the truth are clear. This aggressive war by Russia goes against the principles that lie at the heart of the United Nations Charter. If we read the words of the Charter itself, they're there. I have them here. Article 2. I will read it in English. The organization is based on the principle of the sovereign equality of all its members. All members, in order to ensure to all to all of them the rights and benefits resulting from membership shall fill in good faith the obligations assumed by them in accordance with the present charter. All members shall settle their international disputes by peaceful means in such a manner that international peace and security and justice are not endangered. President Putin would have us believe that there is some kind of conspiracy against the Russian Federation. This concept was recycled late this morning by the representative of another country, that somehow something called the West is seeking to violate Russia's sovereignty and territorial integrity. The West didn't create the Charter. The Soviet Union signed the Charter. China signed the Charter. It wasn't created by the West. It was created by the member states at that time. And we need to understand that there is no grand conspiracy against Russia. The international community is not anti-Russian. Russia is facing the consequences of its own actions. That is to say, launching an illegal and disastrous further invasion of Ukraine on the basis of President Putin's desire for an empire that is long since gone. And as I said in French, apparently imperial habits die a very hard death. As Russia makes claim of Russophobia, sort of like the, the kid who kills his parents and then goes to the court and says, help me out, I'm an orphan. There is no Russophobia. Its own soldiers, its own artillery, its own tanks, its own warplanes, its own missiles are flattening Russian-speaking cities and towns and abusing Russian-speaking populations in eastern Ukraine. No country is seeking to violate Russia's sovereignty or its territorial integrity. The International Court of Justice said there was no evidence to support that allegation by the Russian Federation. Instead, it is Russia that has twice violated Ukraine's sovereignty and territorial integrity since 2014. Russia has similarly violated the sovereignty and the territorial integrity of both Georgia and Moldova. Russian says, oh, we're speaking the language of sovereignty and political independence and territorial integrity, and it claims that it's a friend of the Charter. The reality is today there is no greater threat to the purposes and the principles of the UN Charter than Russia's war of aggression against Ukraine and its annexation that has taken place in the last few days. No one is bent on Russia's destruction. The Ukrainian people are valiantly defending themselves to secure their freedom and their survival from Russia's war of aggression. Together with many of our allies and partners, we in Canada are taking what we believe are proportional and necessary steps in response, including supporting Ukraine with the means to defend itself from Russia's aggression and to reclaim its territory. It can be argued and shown that Article 51 of the Charter, in fact, anticipates a situation just like this, because it says very explicitly, nothing in the present Charter shall impair the inherent right of individual or collective self-defense if an armed attack occurs against a member of the United Nations until the Security Council has taken measures necessary to maintain international peace and security. We do not seek Russia's destruction. What we seek is for the Russian Federation to live up to its commitments under the UN Charter and under international law. To behave as a responsible member of the international community like Ukraine, like so many other members of this assembly, 
to act as a steward of the charter and a steward of the peace of the world, as was clearly anticipated in creating the status of permanent members whose mission in life it would be to preserve territorial integrity and to preserve global security. It's exactly the opposite of what Russia is now doing. The Russian Federation has the power to end this war. It has the power to end the untold misery that it has caused. The impacts have been felt most severely in Ukraine and by the many Ukrainians who have died by the mindless systematic destruction of infrastructure and the necessary means of life. But we also have to remember, and every delegate here knows this, the inequality of the world has historically been our greatest challenge, as well as the security of the world. Then came COVID. Then is climate change always with us. But now comes this aggression, which has had a devastating impact, not simply on the people and the economy and the society of Ukraine, but is having a devastating impact on the economies of each and every country that is represented here at the United Nations. Secretary General has said we're facing a winter of discontent. The International Monetary Fund reported yesterday that we're heading for an unprecedented global recession. Think how much better it would be if instead of debating this motion, which we simply have to debate because the Security Council is not capable of doing its job because Russia has a veto, think how much better it would be if we were debating in this chamber how can we rebuild and how can we remake the economies and societies that have been so devastated by the impact of the cascading crises that we've been facing over the last decade. Instead of which, we're being forced to go back to square one and say, let's call it what it is, an illegal aggression, an illegal annexation, and that if Russia would refrain from any further unlawful threat or use of force and to completely and unconditionally withdraw its military forces from the ter territory of Ukraine that it has illegally occupied, we would see an end to this terrible, terrible tragedy, and we could start to rebuild. Not just rebuild Ukraine, but rebuild the economies of, of the world, including Russia. We have twice now demanded this as an assembly. We are doing it now for the third time, in response to the sham referenda and the desperate attempts to prolong what can only be described as a truly senseless, cruel, and brutal war of aggression. The Charter calls on us all to unite our strength, as it puts it, to maintain international peace and international security. Mr. President, I want to suggest that we must, all of us, rise to this call today to defend the Charter. And with it, yes, Ukraine's sovereignty, territorial integrity, and political independence. But in fact, not just the sovereignty of Ukraine, the sovereignty of each and every member state here. Not just the territorial integrity of Ukraine, but the territorial integrity of each and every country that is represented here. And not just the political independence of Ukraine, but the independence of all of us self-governing nations who are represented here. Thank you, Mr. President. I thank the distinguished representative of Canada now I give the floor to the distinguished representative of France. Mr. President, today's debate is a straightforward one. It can be summed up in one sentence. Do we want to defend the principles of the United Nations Charter? This question concerns us all. 
since the Charter is the cement that binds the United Nations organization. It guarantees the peaceful coexistence of sovereign states. Now, in attacking Ukraine, Russia has not only unleashed an atrocious war with global repercussions in food, energy, economic, and nuclear terms, but she has also deliberately violated the most basic principles of international law. That was stated totally unambiguously by the International Court of Justice, which already on the 16th of March ordered the suspension of Russian military activities in Ukraine. It has to be said that Russia has in no way respected that decision. The forceful acquisition of territory must be a subject of concern for each member state of this assembly. By invading its neighbor, Russia has decided to open the way towards other wars of annexation. What is happening today in Europe could happen elsewhere tomorrow, in Asia, in Africa, Latin America. We must be conscious of this. Mr. President, while Russia continues to deliberately bomb in an intentional and indiscriminate way towns and civilian infrastructure, and as it multiplies the abuses that clearly constitute war crimes, France will never resign itself to a world in which force overrides law. It will never recognize the fake referenda nor the illegal annexation of entire swathes of, in, of Ukrainian territory. France will continue to support Ukraine, its sovereignty and territorial integrity as long as necessary. That is why France has worked with its partners during a transparent and inclusive process to draft a text that everyone should be able to support. This text is concise. It condemns the annexation of territory conquered by the use of force. We are all basically faced with a simple choice. Accept war or defend peace. It's not a question of choosing one side, but of maintaining international order and its values. Abstention is not an option. France encourages, therefore, all members of the United Nations to defend the Charter and its universal principles. Thank you. I thank the distinguished representative of France. And now I give the floor to the distinguished representative of China. Mr. President, it has been nearly eight months since the crisis in Ukraine broke out. As we speak, the conflict is still raging on, flames of fighting still spreading, and the prospect for a peaceful settlement not yet in sight. The crisis is getting increasingly protracted, expanded, and complicated, and its spillover effects further penetrating to and affecting economy and people's livelihood, bringing more instability and uncertainty to an already turbulent world and causing deep concern. During the recently concluded general debate of the UN General Assembly, state leaders from around the world expressed their views and propositions on the crisis in Ukraine. Despite differences in views, a common thread is that most countries called on the parties to the conflict to cease fighting the soonest and resolve the crisis peacefully through dialogue. They called for greater humanitarian relief for the people of Ukraine who are deeply affected by the crisis. They called for joint international efforts to mitigate the spillover impact, especially that on developing countries. 
and they all called for unity to avoid block confrontation triggered by the crisis and the start of a new Cold War. These appeals and demands should be the focus of our attention and the goal to be achieved at this emergency special session. In this regard, China wishes to emphasize the following. First, sticking to dialogue and engagement for a political settlement to the crisis in Ukraine. China is deeply worried about the recent intensification of ground conflicts and deplores the civilian casualties and damages to civilian facilities thus caused. What is urgent now is to guide the parties concerned to exercise restraint, avoid escalation of conflicts, prevent confrontation from getting out of control, and de-escalate the situation. In the final analysis, the Ukraine crisis has to be resolved peacefully. However daunting the difficulties and challenges are, the door to political settlement shall not be closed, diplomatic negotiations shall not be stalled, and efforts to stop hostilities and promote peace talks shall not be slackened. The international community must encourage the parties concerned to relaunch peace talks as soon as possible, incorporate reasonable concerns into negotiations, put feasible options on the table, and create conditions and space for cessation of hostilities and settlement to the crisis. Second, increasing humanitarian relief and alleviating the plight of the civilians affected. Since the outbreak of the crisis, the humanitarian situation in Ukraine has been deteriorating and the coming long winter will further aggravate their difficulties. China commends Ukraine's neighboring countries for hosting millions of refugees and supports the UN and international humanitarian agencies in assisting Ukraine and helping share the burden of its neighbors based on the principles of humanity, neutrality, impartiality, and independence. Parties to the conflict should strictly observe international humanitarian law, refrain from harming innocent civilians, give priority to protecting women, children, and other vulnerable groups, facilitate evacuation and land cooperation with regard to humanitarian aid. China calls on the international community to increase humanitarian assistance to Ukraine and its neighboring countries to ensure proper resettlement of the people affected by the conflict. The safety and security of nuclear facilities cannot be compromised, not even by the smallest margin. We call on all parties concerned to exercise restraint and prevent any occurrence of irreparable humanitarian disaster. Third, strengthening solidarity and cooperation to minimize the spillover effects of the conflict. The interwoven impact of COVID-19 pandemic and the crisis in Ukraine has exposed all countries in the world, developing countries in particular, to a myriad of challenges, including food security, energy security, and financial security, making it all the more difficult to realize the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. All out and indiscriminate sanctions will not help solve the problem. Instead, they will only disrupt the stability of global supply and industrial chains amplify the spillover effect of the crisis and affect the normal life of the world people. The conclusion and implementation of the Black Sea Grain Shipment Agreement has played a positive role in stabilizing global food prices and in improving food supply in developing countries. We encourage more such efforts and look forward to more similar arrangements. We call on the international community, the UN in particular, to keep development high on the international agenda, diffuse the spillover effects of the crisis in Ukraine, help developing countries overcome difficulties, and prevent the hard-won development gains from going down the drain. Fourth, abandoning the Cold War mentality and preventing the world from falling into division. The crisis in Ukraine shows once again that clinging to the Cold War mentality and block politics, creating block confrontation and pursuing absolute security will not bring peace, but will only lead to conflicts, which serves no one's interests. At a time when the world needs unity and cooperation to overcome difficulties, it is irresponsible and dangerous to focus on ideological differences, intimidate and force other countries to take sides, create isolation and exert pressure, and engage in decoupling and chain cutting. 
We must draw lessons from history, reject division and confrontation, uphold solidarity and cooperation, practice multilateralism, and jointly safeguard the international system with the UN at its core and the international order based on international law, with a view to promoting world peace and development. Mr. President, the General Assembly, as the most representative organ of the United Nations, should play an active and constructive role on the issue of Ukraine by bridging differences and forming consensus, garnering the greatest synergy for peace talks and finding the greatest common factor among member states. We have always believed that any action taken by the General Assembly should be conducive to the de-escalation of the situation, should be conducive to the early resumption of dialogue, and should be conducive to the promotion of a political solution to this crisis. The draft resolution submitted to this emergency special session for voting will not help achieve the above-mentioned objectives. Therefore, the Chinese delegation will abstain. Moreover, the Chinese delegation wishes to point out that the work of the GA should be conducted in full accordance with the rules of procedure and should reflect fairness and impartiality. With regard to procedural issues, the views of member states should all be fully expressed and their motions should all be given equal weight. Mr. President, on the question of Ukraine, China always maintains that the sovereignty and territorial integrity of all countries should be respected, that the purposes and principles of the UN Charter should be observed, that the reasonable security concerns of all countries should be taken seriously, and that support should be given to all the efforts aimed at peaceful solutions. As a responsible country, China will always stand on the side of peace. We will work with the international community and play a constructive role in de-escalating the situation and seeking a political solution to the crisis. Thank you, Mr. President. I thank the distinguished representative of China. And now I give the floor to the distinguished representative of the United States of America. Mr. President, my fellow delegates, and to all those who dedicate themselves to the noble mission of this institution. Soon, we will vote on a resolution that is important not just for the future of Ukraine and the future of Europe, but to the very foundation foundations of this institution. After all, the UN was built on an idea that never again would one country be allowed to take another country's territory by force. In the wake of World War II, that important idea, despite all of our differences, brought us together. Now we're called upon to defend that idea and the UN Charter that embodies it. Colleagues, the facts are clear. A UN member state, one with a permanent seat on the Security Council, has attempted to annex territory from its neighbor by force. This UN member state has not only put its neighbor in its crosshairs, but also put a bullseye in this institution's core principle. One country cannot take the territory of another by force. Eight years ago, the General Assembly was asked to respond to the same UN member states attempted annexation of Crimea. Back then, the General Assembly defended the UN Charter. We overwhelmingly adopted a resolution affirming Ukraine's sovereignty and territorial integrity. We must do the same today. As in 2014, Russia is testing the resolve of the world to stand up for the core principles of international law. 
How else do you explain the flagrant disregard of the values of sovereignty, territorial integrity, and peace and security? How else do you explain the horrific attacks on civilians and civilian infrastructure that we've seen this week? How else do you explain the saber rattling from Putin and its veiled threats of deploying nuclear force? These are threats against this institution. They are threats against all of us. We've heard countries underscore the need to pursue solutions that lead to dialogue and peace. Believe me, there is nothing we would like to see more than peace. I would like to stop seeing craters in Ukrainian playgrounds where swings used to be. We would like to stop seeing dangerous attacks on the city of Zaporizhia, which threaten civilians. We would like to stop seeing Russia commit war crimes. The path to peace does not run through placations. The path to peace does not involve turning the other way in the face of these flagrant violations. Peace does not and has never come from silence. The only way to bring peace is to stop this aggression, to demand accountability, to stand together with conviction, to show what we will not tolerate, so let us send a clear message today, colleagues. The United Nations will not tolerate attempts at illegal annexation. We will never recognize it. The United, these United Nations will not tolerate seizing a neighbor's land by force. We will stand up to it. These United Nations will not tolerate the destruction of the UN Charter. We will defend it. As the Secretary General said, Russia's actions have no place in our modern world. That is why this resolution calls for peace, and it calls for de-escalation. But it also makes clear that we reject Russia's attempted annexations, that we reject this affront to territorial integrity, to national sovereignty, to peace and security. We reject it because we believe in the United Nations. We believe that the fundamental guardrails of the international system protects us all. Today it's Russia invading Ukraine, but tomorrow it could be another nation whose territory is violated. It could be you. You could be next. What would you expect from this chamber? Our message is loud and clear. It does not matter if you as a nation are big or small, rich or poor, old or new, if you are a UN member state, your borders are your own and are protected by international law. They cannot be redrawn by anyone else by force. This is why all of us together built this institution and that is why we must defend it here and now. Colleagues, today, the United States will proudly vote yes on this resolution. And we urge every country to do the same. And not because we're asking you to do it, but because you know that it is the right thing to do. Let us condemn Russia for its illegal attempted annexations. Let us affirm the borders of every UN member state as they stand. And with the eyes of a worrying world upon us, let us renew our promise, as the UN Charter says, to be good neighbors in the pursuit of a peaceful world. Thank you. I thank the distinguished representative of the United States. And now I give the floor to the distinguished observer of the observer state of the Holy See.
Mr. President, we have heard uh, many words over these past hours. The OLC is taking the floor with a succinct and heartfelt plea to end the madness of this conflict that with every ongoing hour takes innocent lives and deepens the wounds among peoples, destroying the mutual trust upon which the international order depends. Just a few days ago, Pope Francis made this heartfelt appeal, and I quote, in the name of God and in the name of the sense of humanity that dwells in every heart, I renew my call for an immediate ceasefire. May weapons be silenced and may conditions be sought for the start of negotiations that will lead to solutions that are not imposed by force, but consensual, just, and stable. His Holiness clearly indicated that solutions must be based on respect for the sacrosanct value of human life, as well as the sovereignty and territorial integrity of each country. Having addressed a direct appeal to the presidents of the Russian Federation and Ukraine, as well as to all the protagonists of international life and the political leaders of nations, Pope Francis stressed that we gather here in this chamber have a role to play and must do everything possible to bring an end to the war without allowing ourselves to be drawn into dangerous escalations and to promote and support initiatives for dialogue. These words take on greater weight with the added threat of nuclear escalation. It makes even more urgent the transformation of the art of those who hold the outcome of the war in their hands so that the hurricane of violence may cease and peaceful coexistence in justice may be rebuilt. The affirmation of the clear principles of international law that are underlined by the resolution before us and are clearly enshrined in the UN Charter should be understood as opening a path to a just and peaceful solution and not as a way to aggravate the conflict which has already created too many victims. From this hall, may the clarion call of Pope Paul VI sound out again. Jamais plus la guerre, jamais plus. No more guerre, no more war, no more. Thank you, Mr. President. I thank the distinguished observer of the observer state of the Holy See, and now I give the floor to the distinguished observer of the sovereign order, order of Malta. Mr. President, Excellencies, distinguished colleagues, we are now <clears throat> at the conclusion of a strong and dramatic debate driven by conflict and suffering, aggrandizement and force. But unlike other historical precedents, particularly those involving Europe, which were oftentimes conducted in the aftermath of battle, all of this week and the past three quarters of a year, we have been deliberating in the heat of it. And yet the words of this Salvicic assembly uttered amid the burning rage that consumes two sovereign nations seems to have little effect. And in the midst of that burning rage, it is the poor, the sick, and those who have no to go who suffer the most. All of our histories are intertwined. The commonality of human motivation and desire is, is all too evident. Technology and the integration of economies, whether we like it or not, have made all of us more than bystanders. No nation can allow this conflict to spiral out of control because the consequences, as we all know, 
are too terrible to contemplate. And no matter how far away and how isolated we feel we might be, the detritus of burning rage will consume us. The sovereign order of Malta is unique in its sui generis status as both a sovereign entity and as a Catholic religious order, as it seeks to embrace its citizens with charity and love. And those citizens are those who are left behind. They are the forgotten people of the world, often stateless, homeless, the trafficked, the migrant, the refugee, the suffering humanity that is so often left without support and hope. Few states are too proud to refuse help on behalf of those who are in need. Fewer still are unwilling to augment their own services with apolitical and neutral aid which we offer without consideration of religion or politics. Yet today, in the Ukraine, despite recent missile attacks on Lviv, our staff and volunteers continue their mission throughout the country in the same spirit as those heroic employees of Caritas who were so tragically killed in Mariupol in April of this year. Mr. Chairman, we recognize that this debate will shortly close, but we wish to appeal for a cessation of hostilities on behalf of those millions of innocent civilians suffering through no fault of their own. A father crying over a wife killed during a missile attack, an elderly woman crippled and confined to bed while gunfire rages outside her flat, a mother laying to rest her only son, a soldier killed in battle, a child bereft of parents alone. When these vignettes become the norm and when the innocent see no way out of their pain, then we fail the United Nations Charter. That is a beacon of light that brings us all together. Don't let that charter be consumed by burning rage. Collectively, Mr. Chairman, we are better than that, much better than that. Thank you. I thank the distinguished observer of the sovereign order of Malta. And ladies and gentlemen, we have heard the last speaker uh, in the debate on this item. We shall now proceed to consider draft resolution A slash ES 11 slash L5. Before giving the floor uh, for explanation of vote before the vote, May I remind delegations that explanations of vote are limited to 10 minutes and should be made by delegations from their seats. I give the floor to the distinguished representative of the Russian Federation. Mr. President, dear colleagues, during the meeting on October 10th, we already talked about the reasons and goals for holding referendums in the Donetsk and Luhansk republics, as well as the Kherson and Zaporizhia regions. On September 28th, the final results of the referendums were tallied, and the vast majority of those who voted, that is 99% at the DPR, 98% in the LPR, 93% in Zaporizhia, and 87% percent in the Kherson region supported the idea of these regions becoming a part of Russia. Despite the difficult security situation and the provocations of the Kiev regime, the vast majority of voters decided to cast their vote, ranging from 76 percent in the Kherson region to 97 percent in the DPR. The results of the vote speak for themselves. The populations of these regions do not want to return to Ukraine and have made an informed and free choice in favor of our country. The referendums were held in full accordance with the norms and principles of international law, no matter how hard our Western opponents or even the Secretary General, who suddenly decided to speak for the entire United Nations without a mandate, may try to prove otherwise. More than 100 international observers from Italy, Germany, Venezuela, Latvia, and other countries who observed the referendum also recognized its outcome as legitimate. 
Today, however, the General Assembly has been presented with a politicized and openly provocative document that not only ignores all of these facts, but also contains a confrontational charge that could destroy any and all efforts in favor of a diplomatic solution to the crisis in Ukraine. Despite its title, it has nothing to do with the protection of international law and the principles of the UN Charter. By introducing this draft, Western states are pursuing their own geopolitical goals and are once again trying to use the members of the General Assembly as bid players. The expressions of commitment to the protection of international law that you heard today from representatives of the U.S. and other NATO member states are a vivid example of hypocrisy and double standards. It's telling that they have temporarily even stopped mentioning their pet phrase, rule-based order. Let us recall the situation with Kosovo. Today's loudest critics of the referendums were in the forefront of supporters of its independence. They insisted that Kosovo had the right to secede from the state in the event of a real threat of serious violations of their population's rights or remedial secession. That was the official Western legal position presented to the International Court of Justice when it prepared an advisory opinion at the request of the General Assembly in 2008. Yet, by 2008, nothing had threatened the Kosovo Albanias for quite some time. Yugoslavia was no longer on the map, and Serbia, which had been bombed and crushed by NATO countries, had a foreign contingent stationed as peacekeepers. No referendums were held in Kosovo. There was simply a declaration of independence adopted by interim self-governing authorities, which had clearly exceeded their remit. Yet, this alone was enough for the West to recognize the independence of Kosovo. Back then, our opponents argued that international law does not prohibit declaring independence. And what do we hear from them today? That Kosovo was different. In other words, NATO members were prepared to protect the Kosovo Albanians and protect them from threats that didn't even exist at the time, whereas the populations of Donbass, Kherson, and Zaporizhia are in their view, second-class citizens whose extermination by the Kiev regime does not worry the civilized West one bit because they support Russia. Another example is Washington, which today is the loudest to criticize us and cry out about the territorial integrity of Ukraine. Recently, Washington declared its readiness to use force to protect Taiwan, which is an integral part of the People's Republic of China. It is clear that no sanctity of the principle of territorial integrity exists for the U.S. and NATO member states. They support it only when it suits their interests. Today's draft is simply chock full of these ugly double standards imposed by the West, and now its authors are trying to force the General Assembly to endorse them. The Secretary General is cited, even though no such practice exists in the preparation of GA resolutions because the statements of the Secretary General do not represent the views of member states. But even leaving this aside, we have never seen our Western colleagues pay the same amount of attention to other statements by the UN Secretary General where he calls for resolving conflicts in other parts of the world including those unleashed at the behest of Western states, where women and children are dying and where the economy is suffering. In particular, they stubbornly ignore his call to end illegal unilateral economic sanctions. The West is completely deaf to the problems of the global South and to calls to finally address them. All efforts are thrown at promoting the Ukrainian narrative, but not for the sake of the country's well-being, only in an attempt to harm Russia. Today's draft selectively cites the declarations of principle governing relations between states of 1970. Not a word is said about the rights of peoples to self-determinations which paved the way for decolonization and made it possible for many states present in this hall today to gain a seat in the General Assembly. Today, they are trying to make you forget that the West opposed this process with all its might while the, United, while the Soviet Union contributed to it. In recent days, we have all witnessed how the West, driven by neocolonial instincts, unleashed an unprecedented campaign of blackmail and arm twisting against developing states, trying by any means to force to support them the anti-Russian draft resolution. We know that uh, there were efforts made in Washington 
and that the capitals of members of the non-aligned movement were literally besieged by U.S. political emissaries and their airlines who directly threatened punishment and consequences for disobedience. This was even written about in leading Western media. Politico magazine quotes U.S. State Department officials whose words clearly show how Washington and other Western capitals truly feel about the voices of developing countries. Those officials said that when it comes to voting on the anti-Russian draft in the GA, and I quote, every Fiji counts, every Palau counts, end of quote. I wonder if the representatives of Fiji and Palau enjoy hearing such quotes. These are all classic methods used by slave owners and colonizers who are used to seeing the world through a colonial prism. I will not conceal the fact that in these days, a number of colleagues from the Global South have approached us to tell us about the economic blackmail and direct threats that they have had to endure from the U.S. and European states. It is clear that in this situation, the votes that we will see on our monitors should be seen precisely through the prism of the Western blackmail campaign, which is unprecedented in the GAA. Such methods do not and cannot have a place in the United Nations. Today, we are all present at a truly historic meeting. Before our very eyes, the United States and its satellites are teaching us a lesson in desovereignization live on air. We regret that the unscrupulous Western black members who have been trying to wrestle the votes they need from developing states were aided by the President of the General Assembly, whose procedural maneuvering on October 10th during the first day of the resumed special session not only deprived UN members of the opportunity to vote without coercion through secret ballot, but also gave the blackmailers additional time to carry out their blackmail. I hope that despite all of this, there will be enough states present in this room today uh, that are prepared to stand up to the Western dictate and to vote independently without fear of surveillance from Big Brother. We call on UN member states to take an unbiased look at the current situation and vote against the draft before us. Thank you. I thank the distinguished representative of the Russian Federation and now I give the floor to the distinguished representative of the Bolivarian Republic of Venezuela. Mr. President, today we are participating in this plenary session as a result of the activation of the mechanism established under General Assembly Resolution 76262, which requires that it be convened. However, we are not obliged to consider, and much less to approve, a resolution on which consultations were never convened nor were any efforts made to take into account the views and proposals of all the member states of this body. This all shows the clear lack of interest of its proponents in forging a consensus on the text. We are convinced that this method of work will not bring us closer to the objective that should bring us all together equally, that of achieving peace. Mr. President, just over seven months ago, when we met for the first time in this same room, we alerted the international community to the existence of a triple crisis in Eastern Europe that, if not addressed in a balanced and cautious manner, would lead us to a dangerous phase of heightened tension between nuclear powers, which, given the shift in strategic and security balances, could unleash a conflict of global proportions. Today, we regret that our warnings have gone unheeded and that, far from having been used in recent months to build a path that would put a stop to the escalation of tensions, to bring us closer to a peaceful resolution of the conflict, we now find ourselves at a moment of greater confrontation, greater tension, and greater division. However, as a country that believes that peace is the only way forward, we cannot but continue to insist that today our role must be to correct course and create a firewall between the three levels of the crisis in Ukraine, thus preventing a chain reaction that could lead us like sleepwalkers to the abyss. Today, as never before in the last 60 years, we are getting closer and closer to a point of no return that has the serious potential of compromising the survival of present and future generations. We have to recognize this fact. Today, we see the start of a conflict of nuclear dimensions seems to be getting closer. 
we see with great concern an increase in actions and policies that seem only to seek to create a clash of blocks with the false illusion of a definitive unipolar victory. This clash will cause a world conflict between nuclear powers which will destroy humanity as we know it today. Mr. President, this is not the time to instrumentalize this General Assembly or to entrench a new Cold War mentality with its block clash policy, which could result in serious miscalculations with unimaginable consequences for humanity as a whole. We must, therefore, make a collective effort to reduce the, the temperature of the rhetoric, bearing in mind that, as the facts show, excessive speeches are precursors to violent actions and on the one hand these encourage a dangerous illusion of control over events at the other on the other hand they deliberately stray from the path of peace in this context we can in no way allow war rhetoric to be normalized nor must we allow attempts be made to convince entire nations that a nuclear war would have winners and losers when the reality is that it would only produce death and destruction, pain and suffering for all alike. It is mutually assured destruction. That path, Mr. President, that path of fiery speeches and reckless actions is not only the wrong path to take, it's an irresponsible one that only places humanity at greater risk. For all those reasons, we believe that the draft resolution contained in document A stroke ES 11 stroke L5 will in no way contribute to the objective of achieving lasting peace through political dialogue and diplomatic negotiations. Which is why we call on the responsible members of the international community to vote against the said text. Quite the contrary, our organization must play the central role that corresponds to it at this historic and decisive moment for the preservation of humanity through the facilitation of a constructive environment and in good faith that promotes dialogue, negotiation and the achievement of a peaceful solution. To conclude, we appeal for the reduction of tension and, the, and an end to the war propaganda, as well as an end to intolerant speech guided by ideologies of hate. At the same time, we believe that only through diplomacy, dialogue and containment, without pressure or sanctions, will we be able to avoid being pushed deliberately towards a more acute phase of this conflict, towards a longer and more difficult phase to resolve, and towards a phase that only prolongs the crisis over time and generates consequences that it will take generations to overcome. Thank you, Mr. President. I thank the distinguished representative of the Bolivarian Republic of Venezuela. And now I give the floor to the distinguished representative of Nepal. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, my delegation is deeply distressed by the protracted violence and conflict in Ukraine. It has posed a serious threat to international peace and security. Nepal's position on Ukraine has remained clear that the principles of sovereignty, territorial integrity, political independence, and non-aggression as enshrined in the United Nations Charter are inviolable and must be fully respected by all member states at all times. There cannot be any ifs, ands, or buts. The United Nations Charter clearly stipulates that all members must settle their international disputes by peaceful means in such a manner that international peace and security and justice are not endangered. Peaceful coexistence, non-aggression, non-interference, respect for sovereignty, territorial integrity, and political independence are the fundamentals of Nepal's foreign policy. And these principles are foundations of peace and security and stability in the world. Nepal reiterates its call for the cessation of hostilities in Ukraine to create conditions for dialogue and diplomacy, which are the only pathway to resolve conflicts and find a lasting political solution. 
Mr. President, based on Nepal's long-standing principled position on the inviolability of sovereignty, territorial integrity, and political independence of all the states, and its unwavering respect for international law, rules-based international system, the UN Charter, and the values of the world peace, my delegation will vote in favor on the draft resolution L5 that is before us today. I thank you, Mr. President. I thank the distinguished representative of Nepal. And now I give the floor to the distinguished representative of St. Vincent and Grenadines. Mr. President, St. Vincent and the Grenadines will vote in favor of the draft resolution before us and wishes to offer an explanation of its vote before the vote. The recent referenda and subsequent signing of treaties to annex several regions are deeply disturbing developments in the ongoing conflict in Ukraine. We do not consider that the matter in which the referenda were conducted was in accordance with the tenets of international law. As such, they constitute violations of Ukraine's sovereignty, political independence, and territorial integrity. Our vote in favor of the resolution serves to firmly underscore that the bedrock principles of sovereignty, political independence, and territorial integrity must be respected and strictly adhered to by all. These principles are sacrosanct, and they should be applied consistently and upheld in the international community as universal truths. The conflict in Ukraine has tragically resulted in great loss of life and the destruction of critical civilian infrastructure. Additionally, its global repercussions have had catastrophic impacts on countries located far beyond its borders. We therefore reiterate the resounding call for an, Im an immediate cessation of hostilities and for the exercise of restraint in all actions. The only path towards peace, Mr. President, is through diplomatic engagement that prioritizes constructive dialogue and good faith negotiations that take into consideration the legitimate security concerns of all parties. Provocative rhetoric, unproductive diplomatic posturing, and actions that exacerbate tensions and intensify the existing high alert postures, which bring us increasingly closer to nuclear catastrophe, are unhelpful and wholly objectionable. A responsible international community should therefore seek to encourage the type of engagement that prevents further polarization and facilitates a prompt diplomatic resolution to this conflict. The incessant talk on all sides of total victory, whatever that means, opens the door to a nuclear Armageddon. Let us give mature diplomacy a chance to achieve peace. Mr. President, peace is the legitimate aspiration of all peoples. The world cannot countenance, nor can it afford, another catastrophic conflict. I thank you and peace profound. I thank the distinguished representative of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Ladies and gentlemen, we have heard the last speaker in explanation of vote before the vote. Before proceeding to take a decision on draft resolution A slash ES 11 slash L5, I wish to address the question concerning the majority required for the adoption of the draft resolution. In light of Article 18, paragraphs 2 and 3 of the Charter of the United Nations, is there any objection to taking action on draft resolution A slash ES 11 slash L5 by a two-thirds majority of the members present and voting. I see no objection. 
the two-thirds majority of members present and voting is therefore required for the adoption of the draft resolution A slash ES 11 slash L5. The Assembly will now take a decision on draft resolution A slash ES 11 slash L5 entitled, I quote, Territorial Integrity of Ukraine, Defending the Principles of the Charter of the United Nations, end of quote. For your information, the draft resolution has closed for e-sponsorship. I now give the floor to the representative of the Secretariat. Mr. President, I should like to announce that since the submission of the draft resolution, and in addition to the delegations listed on the EU document, the following countries have also become co-sponsors of A slash ES 11 slash L5. Andorra, Antigua and Barbuda, Bahamas, Belize, Bosnia and Herzegovina, Cabo Verde, Cambodia, Chile, Costa Rica, Dominican Republic, Ecuador, Fiji, Guyana, Jamaica, Marshall Islands, Federated States of Micronesia, Monaco, Myanmar, New Zealand, North Macedonia, Panama, Papua New Guinea, Samoa, San Marino, Singapore, Suriname, Switzerland, Tonga, United Kingdom, United States, and Uruguay. If any other countries wish to co-sponsor A slash ES 11 slash L5, please signify by pressing the microphone button. I see Comoros. Liberia, although Liberia is already on the L document. Thank you, Mr. President. I thank the representative of the Secretariat. At its 12th plenary meeting of the emergency special session, the General Assembly decided to take action on draft resolution A slash ES 11 slash L5 by recorded vote. We shall now begin the voting process. Those in favor of draft resolution A slash ES 11 slash L5, please signify. Those against or abstentions. The General Assembly is now voting on draft resolution A slash ES 11 slash L5 entitled Territorial Integrity of Ukraine, Defending the Principles of the Charter of the United Nations. Will all delegations confirm that their votes are accurately reflected on the screen? The voting has been completed. Please lock the machine. The results, the results of the vote is as follows. In favor, 143, against 5. Abstentions, 35. Draft resolution A slash ES 11 L slash L5 is adopted. Before giving the floor to the explanation of vote after the vote, may I remind delegations that explanations of vote are limited to 10 minutes and should be made by delegations from their seats. 
I give the floor to the distinguished representative of Saudi Arabia speaking on behalf of the Gulf Cooperation Council. Shukran. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, it gives me pleasure to deliver this statement on behalf of states member in the GCC. The states of the GCC follows with, cons with extreme concern the situation in the Ukraine since the conflict started. We would like to stress that the countries of the, of the Council are, uh, have friendly relations with all parties and are uh, convinced that the best way to, uh, to avoid any negative repercussions is through the settlement of the crisis diplomatically and through dialogue in a way that caters to the interests of all parties concerned. Therefore, members of the Council urge all parties to, to exercise self-restraint, to avoid um, escalation, and to adopt peaceful means of the, dispute, the, the resolution of disputes. The voting of the member states of the GCC in favor of the draft resolution comes out of our commitment to the, uh, uh, to the firm principles of international law and the Charter of the United Nations. We confirm the need to respect the sovereignty of states, good neighborly relationships, and abstention from the use or threat of use of force, as well as settling disputes peacefully. In conclusion, Mr. President, the member states of the GCC would like to express their hope that work will continue until a, a satisfactory solution to all parties is reached to avoid any further humanitarian, political, economical uh, situ uh, repercussions as well. Thank you, Mr. President. I thank the distinguished representative of Saudi Arabia. And now I give the floor to the distinguished representative of Angola. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The Republic of Angola voted in favor of this resolution in accordance with these convictions on the well-founded of the sacrosanct principle of territorial integrity in its own, own constitution, which defines Angola as a unitary and divisible state whose territory is inviolable and inalienable. Our position is also in line with positions of the Charter of United Nations and constitutive act of the African Union, indeed, the predecessor organization of the African Union, the organization of Africa unity, did lay down the basis for the same principle when the founding fathers wisely decided in 1964 to maintain the principle of the intangibility of the borders inherited from the colonialism. Mr. President, since the 60s, the Russian public, pub, people have always shown their friendship and solidarity with the Angolan people, having played a decisive role in our liberation struggle against colonialism and invasion of the Angolan territory by the army of the apartheid regime of South Africa. Today, we have a close relation of friendship and cooperation with the Russian Federation in several areas of common interest. With Ukraine, the Republic of Angola also enjoys good diplomatic relations and cooperation. These relations constitute one of the facts that justify the deep concern constantly expressed by the Republic of Angola about the war between the Russian Federation and Ukraine, which, in addition to causing countless human casualties, has generated thousands of displaced people and refugees never seen since the Second World War, as well as the destruction of important infrastructures of Ukraine. The same war has also had serious consequences on world peace and security, as well as one of the economy of all countries in general. Mr. President, the Republic of Angola, therefore, reiterates its appeal to the parties to cease hostilities and strive for a peaceful resolution of the conflict through dialogue in full respect of international law. The call of the Republic of Angola for a peaceful resolution is in line with African Union principles of non-indifference as well as with the efforts of ex, ex Excellency 
João Manuel Gonçalves Lourenço, President of Republic of Angola to promote peace and security in Africa in his capacity as Chairman of and Champion of the African Union for Peace and Re Reconciliation in Africa. I thank you very much. I thank the distinguished representative of Angola, and now I give the floor to the distinguished representative of Algeria. Mr. President, Said the Rais. Mr. President, Algeria would like to express its grave concern over the deterioration of the situation in the Ukraine and the exacerbation of polarization that contributes largely to the escalation of the crisis and its repercussions on international peace and security, in addition to the uh, to the exacerbation due to this crisis in both the food and energy crisis and their uh, destructive effects on member states. These are added to, this, to the challenges that countries of the world face, particularly developing countries that are hardly working to overcome the results of COVID-19. In this regard, and based on our positions of principle and out of our belief in the principles of the non-aligned movement, Algeria would like to confirm yet once again that we are firmly uh, committed to the principles of international law and the principles and objectives of the Charter of the United Nations, particularly the respect for the sovereignty of states and opposition categorically to the annexation of territories by law, which is considered a breach of international law. We appeal to the international community and the United Nations to uh, discharge their responsibilities and to cease fully the approach of double standards and to work on ending all forms of occupation and annexation of territories by force that are listed on our agenda for decades, particularly in Palestine and the occupied Syrian Golan, as well as the uh, Western Sahara. As such, Algeria would like to stress that the multilateral international efforts require that we reinforce dialogue and cooperation and focus on meaningful diplomatic efforts so that we can find a solution to the crisis and avoid a total collapse of, of diplomatic norms so that we can arrive at a consensual political solution that guarantees the prevalence of international peace and security. Thank you, sir. I thank the distinguished representative of Algeria, says the president. I give the floor to the distinguished representative of South Africa. Thank you, Mr. President. South Africa is deeply concerned by the ongoing war in Ukraine, the increased loss of life and the deteriorating humanitarian situation. The detrimental effects of this war are also being felt all over the world. We urge parties to the conflict to fully respect international humanitarian law and international human rights law. Civilians, humanitarian personnel, vulnerable persons, including women and children, must be fully protected. Speaking in this assembly in March, we said that wars have no winners and that the real heroes are those who work for peace. It is therefore regrettable that in the case of Ukraine, peace remains elusive. Instead, we see steps being taken to encourage a continuation of the war. All parties are reminded that they must comply with the laws of war as contained in the Geneva Conventions, in particular those relating to the targeting of civilians. The principle of distinction is clear that all parties should take responsibility to ensure that civilians are not targeted. Mr. President, South Africa considers the territorial integrity of states and that of Ukraine to be sacrosanct and we reject all actions 
that undermine the purposes and principles of the UN Charter and international law. We have noted the statement of the UN Secretary General, Mr. Antonio Guterres, when he said that any annexation of a state's territory by another resulting from the threat of or use of force is a violation of the principle of the UN Charter and international law. We abstained on the resolution because we believe that the objective of this assembly, in keeping with its mandate, must always be to contribute to a constructive outcome conducive to the creation of sustainable peace in Ukraine. Unfortunately, some elements of the resolution do not address this. In the context of the heightened tensions in recent days, all efforts should be geared towards a ceasefire and a political solution. Mr. President, the General Assembly must stand together in seeking peace and unanimously call for an immediate end to the war. That should be our immediate focus. We therefore expected that any additional resolutions would focus on concrete proposals to end the war, which is exacting such a heavy toll on the people of Ukraine. South Africa remains steadfast that dialogue, mediation, and diplomacy is the only path that will lead to a peaceful resolution of the conflict. We reiterate our call for a cessation of hostilities as a matter of urgency. This will create the necessary environment required for a political process leading to sustainable peace, taking into account the concerns of all affected states. We were encouraged by the efforts of the Secretary General to finalize an agreement for the export of grain and fertilizers to countries in need. We hope that this important example could be the basis for an agreement leading to a diplomatic resolution of the conflict. We therefore call on the UN Secretary General to use his good offices to mediate in pursuit of finding a sustainable solution and for us as member states to facilitate an enabling environment for dialogue and a negotiated solution to the conflict. South Africa stands ready to work with all member states to contribute to the creation of this conducive environment. We urge the UN Security Council to play a constructive role in the resolution of this conflict, in line with its mandate for the maintenance of international peace and security. The Council cannot abandon its responsibility during this term. And to the women and children of Ukraine, we wish you strength. I thank you. I thank the distinguished representative of South Africa. And now I give the floor to the distinguished representative of Pakistan. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, Pakistan abstained in the vote on the draft resolution in document A stroke ES 11 stroke L5. Pakistan fully supports the resolution's call for respect for the principle of the sovereignty and territorial integrity of states, a principle which also applies to Ukraine as to other member states. States cannot be torn apart by the use of force. These principles must be consistently and universally respected. In the case of the referenda mentioned in the draft resolution, we acknowledge Ukraine's complex history and the provisions of the Minsk Agreement. However, under international law, the right of self-determination applies to peoples who are under foreign or colonial domination and those who have not yet exercised the right to self-determination as in the case of Jammu and Kashmir. We look forward to seeing similar concern and condemnation about the attempts by India to formalize its illegal annexation of the internationally recognized disputed territory of 
Indian illegally occupied Jammu and Kashmir in complete violation of international law and relevant resolutions of the UN Security Council on Jammu and Kashmir. Mr. President, moreover, the exercise of the right to self-determination should be conducted in an environment free of military occupation and under impartial auspices, preferably under the supervision of the United Nations. Pakistan therefore endorses the basic principle reflected in the draft resolution that referenda conducted for peoples and regions which are part of a sovereign state and in an environment which is not free and not under impartial auspices are ultra virus and legally unacceptable. Unfortunately, the draft resolution contains several provisions which go beyond declaring the referenda null and void and includes provisions which my delegation has been unable to endorse. These are, one, in PP3, the resolution recalls Resolution 68262 uh, and Resolution of uh, 24 March, all of which Pakistan abstained on. Secondly, the co-sponsors of the draft resolution have not accepted proposals for an immediate peaceful resolution of the conflict. My delegation believes that irrespective of the origin of the conflict, the highest priority at this moment is the immediate cessation of hostilities and the resumption of a peaceful dialogue through direct negotiations, mediation, or other peaceful means to resolve the causes of the conflict and restore peace and security in Ukraine. Unless we halt the conflict, there is every likelihood that it will escalate further with consequences that could be devastating for the entire world. I thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. President. I thank the distinguished representative of Pakistan. And now I give the floor to the distinguished representative of Egypt. Shukran, Sayyid Rais. Thank you, Mr. President. The delegation of Egypt supported the draft resolution in accordance with its position of principle, namely preserving the principles and purposes of the UN Charter, rejecting the threat or use of force in disputes, and choosing peaceful methods of dispute settlement as well as respecting the territorial integrity of states. This is something that Egypt has upheld for seven decades as a founding country of the United Nations without ever having wavered in these principles at any stage. Egypt reiterates its call to the parties in the conflict, namely Russia and Ukraine and all those with influence to bear to put an end to the hostilities and contain the negative impacts that this conflict is having on civilians in order to make sure that both parties' interests can be addressed in an equal manner and to ensure international peace, stability, and security. The current situation should prompt the international community to stop and ask itself whether it is possible to avoid a crisis and can reason prevail Where would we be if we stopped to listen to each other, to engage in dialogue, and to develop resolutions that take interests of both parties into account? We would be in a better world indeed. We refuse double standards and are committed to the principles of peaceful settlements of disputes because if selective standards and approaches continue, crises will only get worse, and the international order will be unable to resolve them efficiently, and this will ultimately lead to a system 
that is unable to resolve disputes between parties. This crisis is impacting the entire world, developing states, including Egypt, are the most affected when it comes to the energy and food prices, as, and in particular grain prices, which are an essential commodity for our population. There are also impacts on economic activity, employment, and inflation. And our concerns about these impacts are not being heard. No one is attempting to address them. Through this rostrum, Egypt calls for reason, f calls to dialogue, and to refrain from any actions that could worsen the current crisis. It calls for international efforts to address this crisis before it reaches a point of non-return. and before incommensurable resources are lost that could have been used in the interest of all. Thank you, Mr. President. I thank the distinguished representative of Egypt. And now I give the floor to the distinguished representative of India. Mr. President, India is deeply concerned at the escalation of the conflict in Ukraine including the targeting of civilian infrastructure and the deaths of civilians. We have consistently advocated that no solution can ever be arrived at the cost of human lives. Escalation of hostilities and violence is in no one's interest. We have urged that all efforts be made for an immediate cessation of hostilities and an urgent return to the path of dialogue and diplomacy. We believe that the global order that we all subscribe to is based on international law, the UN Charter, and respect for the territorial integrity and sovereignty of all states. These principles must be upheld without exception. Dialogue is the only answer to settling differences and disputes, however daunting that may appear at this moment. The path to peace requires us to keep all channels of diplomacy open. We therefore sincerely hope for an early resumption of peace talks to bring about an immediate ceasefire and resolution of the conflict. India stands ready to support all such efforts aimed at de-escalation. It is also unfortunate that as the trajectory of the Ukrainian conflict unfolds, the entire global south has suffered a substantial collateral damage. As developing countries face the brunt of the conflict's consequences on food, fuel, and fertilizer supplies, it is critical that the voice of the Global South be heard and their legitimate concerns duly addressed. We must therefore not initiate measures that further complicate a struggling global economy. Mr. President, there are other pressing, pressing issues at play some of which have not been adequately addressed in the resolution voted today. Our decision to abstain is consistent with our, with our well thought out national position. I would also quote my external affairs minister from his address to this very August assembly last month. And I quote, India is on the side of peace and will remain firmly there we are on the side that respects the UN Charter and its founding principles. We are on the side that calls for dialogue and diplomacy as the only way out. We are on the side of those struggling to make ends meet, even as they stare at the escalating costs of food, of fertilizers, and of fuel. It is therefore in our collective interest to work constructively, both within the United Nations and outside, in finding an early resolution to this conflict. Unquote. Mr. President, my Prime Minister has said unequivocally that this cannot be an era of war. With this firm resolve to strive for a peaceful solution through dialogue and diplomacy, India has decided to abstain. Before I conclude, Mr. President, one final point. 
we have witnessed, unsurprisingly, yet again, an attempt by one delegation to misuse this forum and make frivolous and pointless remarks against my country. Such statements deserve our collective contempt and sympathy for a mindset which repeatedly utters falsehoods. It is important, however, to set the record straight. The entire territory of Jammu and Kashmir is and will always be an integral and inalienable part of India, irrespective of what the representative of Pakistan believes or covets. We call on Pakistan to stop cross-border terrorism so that our citizens can enjoy their right to life and liberty. Thank you. I thank the distinguished representative of India. And now I give the floor to the distinguished representative of Bangladesh. Thank you, Mr. President. Bangladesh has voted in favor of the resolution titled Territorial Integrity of Ukraine, defending the principles of the UN Charter. We did so because we strongly believe that the purposes and principles of the UN Charter regarding respect for sovereignty and territorial integrity and peaceful settlement of all disputes must be complied universally for everyone, everywhere, under all circumstances, without any exception. We also believe that sovereignty and territorial integrity of any country within its internationally recognized borders should be respected. In this connection, we specially underscore the need to take similar uniform stand by the international community against the annexations of Palestinian and other Arab lands by Israel. Bangladesh remains deeply concerned by the continuation of the conflict in Ukraine and its global socioeconomic implications. We believe that antagonism like war or economic sanctions, counter sanctions, cannot bring good to any nation. Dialogue, discussion, and mediation are the best ways to resolve crisis and disputes. As a firm believer of multilateralism, we will continue to stand with the United Nations and the Office of the Secretary General and supporting them in every way we can. We urge that in order to gain the trust and confidence of the people at all levels, the United Nations and the Office of the Secretary General must lead from the front and work to fulfill the expectations of all. Bangladesh, therefore, urges all parties in the conflict to play a constructive role for de-escalation and resume immediate diplomatic dialogue in order to settle all disputes by peaceful means and refrain from taking any action that may endanger international peace and security. We should work towards ending war and stopping arms race for the good of mankind. As member states of the UN, we must continue to work together to promote peace and development. I thank you, Mr. President. I thank the distinguished representative of Bangladesh. And now I give the floor to the distinguished representative of Thailand. Uh, Mr. President, as a small sovereign nation, Thailand holds sacred the UN Charter and international law as they are our first and last line of defense. We are unequivocally committed to the principle of respect for sovereignty and territorial integrity of states as enshrined in the UN Charter. It has long been Thailand's long-standing and consistent policy to be opposed to the threat or use of force against the territorial integrity of any state and to the unprovoked acquisition of the territory of another state by force. However, Thailand chose to abstain from the vote on the resolution because it takes place during an extremely volatile and emotionally charged atmosphere and situation, and thus marginalizes the chance for crisis diplomacy to bring about a peaceful and practical negotiated resolution to the conflict that may push the world towards the brink of nuclear war and global economic collapse. We are genuinely concerned about the increased politicization of international principles that has become counterproductive as the means and guidance to end the war. Condemnation provokes intransigence and therefore greatly reduces the chance 
for constructive engagement. Thailand bemoans the physical, social, and humanitarian destruction of Ukraine and the extreme hardship endured by Ukrainians. We therefore emphasize the need for all stakeholders in this absolute tragedy in Ukraine to de-escalate the conflict and violence and try to find a peaceful means to settle differences by addressing the pragmatic reality and concerns of all involved. Human security and right to life is an important pillar in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, Article 3, and to date such right has been deprived from Ukrainians and many millions of people around the world. It is the ultimate duty and responsibility of this esteemed organization to restore peace and normalcy of life for the Ukrainians, not through violent means, but by diplomatic mechanisms, diplomatic mechanisms that can only bring practical and lasting peace. Thank you. I thank the distinguished representative of Thailand, and now I give the floor to the distinguished representative of Mauritius. Thank you, Mr. President. Mauritius voted in favor of resolution A slash ES 11 slash L5 because Mauritius firmly believes in the respect for sovereignty and territorial integrity of all nations, big or small. We are also firm supporters of the principle of non-interference in the internal matters of any state unless mandated under Chapter 7 of the UN Charter. Mauritius is concerned at the worsening situation in Europe and its consequences on developing states, especially those which depend on food, fuel, and fertilizer imports. We welcome the initiative of the international community to ensure that international law prevails and the principles and values of the UN Charter are respected by all countries. However, we must emphasize that such action must be taken in an indiscriminate manner, just as much as international law must apply indiscriminately. The credibility of our organization suffers when double standards are applied in other cases where there is illegal occupation and where international law continues to be flouted. Thank you. I thank the distinguished representative of Mauritius. And now I give the floor to the distinguished representative of Brazil. Thank you. Mr. President, Brazil voted in favor of draft resolution L5. As we recently stated in the Security Council, Brazil does not believe populations in areas of conflict are able to freely express their opinion by means of referenda. The results thereof do not constitute a valid, a valid expression of their will and cannot be considered legit, legitimate. We voted in favor also because we stand by the principle of territorial integrity of Ukraine as of all member states. International law and the UN Charter must be respected and preserved. <coughs> Mr. President, Inasmuch as the facilitators have shown flexibility, we are disappointed that our proposal to include a clear message urging the parties to cease hostilities and engage in peace negotiations was not included in the draft. Our role is to make room for a peaceful resolution of the conflict to emerge through diplomacy and political dialogue. To this end, we must unite in de-escalate tensions instead of fostering antagonizing views. We must avoid the crystallization of positions and fueling disputes to the detriment of the civilian populations on the ground. Mr. President, lastly, but very importantly, Brazil is deeply concerned with all implicit or explicit threats involve the use of nuclear weapons in connection with the conflict. Any use of nuclear weapons 
is unacceptable and would cause catastrophic humanitarian consequences. Opening avenues for dialogue is our only option out of this conflict. And I thank you. I thank the distinguished representative of Brazil. And now I give the floor to the distinguished representative of Cuba. Senor Pres Mr. President, international relations are moving along a very dangerous path. Economic and political and diplomatic threats, extortion and coercion are being flagrantly used against countries of the South in order to subject us to an order based on capricious rules established by powerful states. This, plus NATO's expansion and its ever more aggressive doctrine and the development of non-conventional conventional war of the fifth generation lead inevitably to a climate of tension and conflicts whose consequences are very unpredictable. Double standards, selectivity, inconsistency, and political manipulation damage the cause of peace and international security. There is a long list of member states of this assembly that in, have suffered the awful consequences of invasions, military attacks, and uh, unilateral sanctions, all in flagrant violation of the United Nations Charter. It's an act of supreme hypocrisy that those who are most responsible for those violations now proclaim themselves to be the defenders of the Charter. Mr. President, Cuba defends the independent sovereignty and territorial integrity of states and self-determination of peoples. The United Nations Charter and international law must be respected by all member states without exception. And in all circumstances, Cuba opposes the use or the threat of the use of force and supports the peaceful resolution of conflicts. In this context, we advocate a serious diplomatic solution that is constructive and realistic of this current crisis in Ukraine through peaceful means and with strict respect for the norms of international law that guarantee the security and sovereignty of all as well as regional and international peace and security. Several months have gone by since the beginning of the conflict in Ukraine. The General Assembly and the Security Council have considered this theme on, in many meetings. Nevertheless, there continues to be a loss of innocent life and material damage and the original causes of this conflict remain unresolved. Cuba is of the opinion that the text submitted to us, which was drafted by a part of the members of the Security Council, in no way contributes to alterating this, altering this scenario. On the contrary, we see the same pattern of earlier resolutions characterized by the absence of any genuine will to de-escalate the crisis and protect human life, which is what should be everyone's core objective and priority. It is our responsibility to reduce tensions, not to inflame them, to achieve a ceasefire and contribute to resolving the conflict, not to exacerbating it. We will not achieve peace by accentuating disputes between the parties or promoting confrontation. Achieving peace is totally contrary to promoting initiatives that sharpen contradictions and confrontation. With regard to the various votes of a procedural nature that have taken that took place last Monday, the 10th of October, we appeal to member states to preserve and respect the integrity of the rules of procedure of the General Assembly. You can count on Cuba's support 
for any initiative which sincerely seeks to promote dialogue and negotiation with the participation of all stakeholders to achieve a genuinely peaceful solution. The draft resolution under consideration today does not meet those requirements. For these reasons, the Cuban delegation has abstained in the vote on the draft resolution. Thank you very much. I thank the distinguished representative of Cuba. And now I give the floor to the distinguished representative of plurinational state of Bolivia. Señor President. Mr. President, allow me to use the to take the floor in this meeting to express Bolivia's uh, position on principle with regard to this or any other conflict that is on the agenda of the United Nations. In strict respect for our constitution and the principles of diplomacy of peoples which guides international institutions, we express our categorical rejection of any aggression being used to resolve uh, conflicts and disputes between states. We reject in the same manner any weakening of the Charter of the United Nations and international law, including annexations and occupations which also contravene the rules upon which we have built multilateralism over more than 70 years. We repeat our request in the 77th session of the General Assembly to work as a community of nations to declare a, the world a zone of peace. Our commitment is with peace, dialogue, mediation, negotiation, reconciliation, arbitrary ar uh, and negotiation. We support the principles and aims of the United Nations Charter, which over recent decades, on many occasions, have been not been respected. Here, we are extremely concerned at the escalation of violence in the military conflict between two countries in Eastern Europe. The effects of this crisis have affected the lives of millions of peoples in entire regions of the world. It has generated economic instability and also affected the energy food uh, uh, sectors. And this affects us all. The double standards in the face of this conflict only worsen the situation. Many speak about defending peace while they continue to supply weapons and promote measures which worsen the violence. Now, curiously, many of the ma serious humanitarian crises which affect the Middle East and Africa have not been at the core of this body's uh, debates. Mr. President, we must find solutions now and proactive measures which, first and foremost, put a break on the conflict and promote uh, conditions to, that ensure peace and international security for all. Now, in this, the United Nations Organization has a fundamental role to play to reduce tension and make progress to committed dialogue to ensure a political and uh, diplomatic uh, exit from this situation. Therefore, we call for the establishment of a high level uh, committee um, with recognized members of, uh, accepted by all the parties to the conflict so that they step up dialogue and uh, peaceful negotiation. Bolivia abstained in the vote because we consider that the decisions that the General Assembly assumes must deal with the uh, solutions and promote genuine platforms for dialogue and peace. Thank you very much. I thank the distinguished representative of plurinational state of Bolivia. Ladies and gentlemen, we have heard the last speaker in explanation of vote after the vote. The exercise of right of reply has been requested. May I remind members that states in the exercise of right of reply are limited to 10 minutes for the first intervention and uh, to five minutes in the second intervention and should be made by delegations from their seats. 
I call on the distinguished representative of Rwanda. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Mr. President, we apologize for taking the floor. It wasn't our intention. However, we are compelled to take the floor, Mr. President, to reply to the comments made by the representative of DRC. Distinguished colleagues, delegates, we are not surprised that DRC's representative has chosen to misuse this platform. DRC's continued misuse of various platforms to engage in baseless and malicious propaganda against neighboring countries, including my own Rwanda, is not new. This has been the tactic used to run away from internal responsibilities to address root causes of conflict in DRC. Rwanda stresses that the BREM game will not address the problems in DRC. DRC has the key and the padlock to solve and to unlock the problems that exist in the country. Externalizing domestic problems of DRC will not solve the problems. It will only serve a short-term goals. Rwanda is fully committed to working with DRC and other neighboring countries through existing frameworks to address the root causes of the problems in DRC including the dignified return of Congolese refugees who have stayed in neighboring countries for too long, including in Rwanda. Political leaders have forced to choose the neighboring countries with unfounded accusations. The grievances and internal concerns of DRC must be addressed internally. Mr. President, we recall that in March 2022, the human rights body, the UN human rights body, issued a report on hate speech in DRC, inciting violence, including among which leaders were implicated. In May and December of 2020, the same body released a report showing that hateful messages were being entrenched within the communities and was pitting the tribes of DRC one after another. In 2022 this year, the international community was alarmed by escalation of hate speech and incitement to discrimination, hostile violence nationwide and specifically against the Kenya Rwanda speakers in DRC. In a statement issued by both UN uh, Human Rights Chief and the Special Advisor on Genocide Prevention, both were disturbed by the increase in violence and hate speech, noting that, I quote, hate speech fuels the conflict by exacerbating mistrust between the communities. These are very serious concerns that must be addressed by DRC. The BREM game will not solve the problem. Distinguished delegates, what DRC is not telling this house is that DRC is home to over 130 armed groups combining both foreign and local armed groups, including FDRR, which is a genocide force which left Rwanda after committing genocide in 1994 until today. It has become a thorn in DRC and a thorn to the Security Council because they can't address that problem. There are existing frameworks, the Nairobi framework, the Rwandan framework, as well as other existing agreements need to be implemented by DRC. Rwanda, like any other regional country, will reject that DRC propaganda narrative that the countries of the region want to invade or have invaded. These are absurd statements without basis and intended to divert the attention from complex internal issues. Delegates, finally, Rwanda believes that the regional approach recommended by the second head of state conclave in Nairobi and the Rwanda Lord Bump in Angola are essential and must be implemented in good faith. The existing frameworks by DRC and several other armed groups also need to be implemented. In this regard, the government of DRC should acknowledge their own obligation than coming to these frameworks or these follow 
and then say that neighboring countries intend to invade them. I thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. I call on the distinguished representative of Pakistan. Thank you so much, Mr. President. Uh, my delegation is exercising its right of reply in response to the comments made by India. Disinformation and falsehood define India's diplomacy today. The biggest falsehood that we just heard is that Jammu and Kashmir is a part of India. Mr. President, Jammu and Kashmir is not a so-called part of India, nor is it India's internal matter. India remains in occupation of an internationally recognized disputed territory whose final disposition needs to be decided in accordance with the democratic principle of a free and impartial plebiscite under the United Nations auspices. As provided for under numerous resolutions of the United Nations Security Council, uh, Security Council. India has accepted this decision and is bound to comply with it in accordance with Article 25 of the United Nations Charter. The maps of the United Nations also show Kashmir as a disputed territory. In Kashmir, the oldest United Nations peacekeeping force is deployed at present along the line of control. Above all, the report which is under consideration by the Security Council itself consider Kashmir as a disputed territory. If India has any respect for international law and moral courage, it will end its reign of terror, withdraw its troops, and let the Kashmiris freely decide their future in accordance with the Security Council resolutions. Mr. President, in order to divert attention from the ever-increasing international condemnation of India's widespread and escalating human rights abuses in Indian illegally occupied Jammu and Kashmir, India continues to level baseless allegation against others. History bears testimony to the undeniable reality that aggressors, colonizers, occupiers often attempt to justify the suppression of legitimate struggle for self-determination as and freedom by portraying them as terrorism. As for comments regarding terrorism, the Indian delegation would do well to reflect on the deeply troubling trajectory their state is embarked upon, rather than indulging in patent falsehood about Pakistan. India is resorting to state terrorism to suppress the people of Indian illegally occupied Jammu and Kashmir, where since 1990, India's terrorist occupation forces have martyred over 100,000 innocent Kashmiris. Over 220,000 women have been widowed and over 180,000 children have been orphaned. In contravention of international law, as well as relevant UNSC resolution, India has resorted to illegally and unilaterally changing the internationally recognized status of Jammu and Kashmir. Today, India is being guided by Hindutva ideology that has mainstreamed Islamophobia and bigotry against minor minorities, particularly Muslim, in its political discourse. In today's incredibly intolerant India, 200 Muslim minorities face frequent lynching by cow vigilantes, programmed by RSS with official complicity, discriminatory citizenship laws to disenfranchise Muslims, and a concerted campaign to destroy mask and rich Muslim heritage of India. Pakistan has been and will continue to highlight these issues and India's state terrorism against the people of Indian illegally occupied Jammu and Kashmir. I thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. I call on the distinguished, distinguished representative of the Democratic Republic of Congo. Leave it, okay. Thank you, Mr. President, for giving me the chance to reply to the delegate from Rwanda. What he's saying is simply total nonsense, uh, because we know, everybody knows that Rwanda had occupied the Congo 
1998 to 2003 uh, and committed a lot of atrocities, plundered our economy, and Rwanda today is a major exporter of gold and coltan, which come from the Congo, uh, and many other resources. They even take uh, chimpanzees and gorillas from uh, Congolese uh, forests, taking them to, to Rwanda. All of this is well known. The United Nations uh, Human Rights Council published a very important report uh, some uh, 10 years ago called uh, um, the, um, uh, the uh, oh, I can't remember the name of the report, but I'll remember in a minute, uh, which points out to many, many crimes committed in the Congo by some of our neighbors, particularly Rwanda. Uh, and so there is no denying the fact that they have been in the Congo uh, since uh, the 1996 when President Laurent Kabila brought them in the country uh, and even named the Rwandan military officer as the chief of staff of the, of the Congolese armed forces. Uh, this again was imposed on him by Rwanda, which had uh, helped him to take power by, the, the, uh, by uh, sending Mr. Mobutu out and taking over the country. Uh, but then after one year, Kabila saw that he was really a stooge of Rwanda and, and Uganda, then asked them to leave the country. What did they do? One week later, they came back to in, invading the country. And this is well known, well documented. I don't think I have to, to, to say too much about it. So what I'm saying was that what we deplore is the fact that the international community is placing a lot of emphasis on and a crisis taking place in Europe, but basically ignoring the crisis taking in Africa. Because while we're sending billions and billions of dollars in arms to Ukraine to defend itself, which I think is okay, they do not do the same for us. They even give us restrictions and as to what we can buy in terms of armaments. So it is a politics of double standards, which I was asking about. It's a politics that should be uh, ended and uh, that the international community are to, uh, to, co to condemn and take action against any invasion of a country, any occupation of a country by another country. Thank you very much. Thank you. I recognize Rwanda uh, asking for the floor for the second intervention. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. President, and I'll make sure I respect the rules. Mr. President, uh, in my culture, really, it is very hard to argue with your senior, your, your, your elder, and I will really respond respectfully. I think the point here is that, uh, that I was trying to make is that um, DRC from, from, from uh, the colonial time, they have had it the difficult past. Uh, Rand is just 28 years old. Uh, these allegations of, of, of uh, every time there's no flowing water is Rwanda, there's no electricity is Rwanda, there's no road it's Rwanda, there's no this is Rwanda or it's colonial masters, something like that. I think we need to move beyond that. We need to move beyond that kind of mentality and look for homegrown solutions, address the problems in your countries. You cannot outsource a solution. You cannot. You cannot outsource a solution here. You have to deal with the issues you face locally and find solutions, sustainable ones. I can say this respectfully, um, uh, colleagues, that um, we have had these excuses. Every time the elections, Rwanda was going to come in the name, in the RC. I know probably after 2023, after elections, you may not hear Rwanda again. And we look forward to the conclusion of the elections. And that's why actually the, the report that he was referring to could not come to mind. Because this has been really allegations and some of you know, the attempted re reports were dismissed and thrown out of the Human Rights Council. If he mentions that report and gives us a UN symbol of that report, I can bet. I can give him bet money on that one. There is no report such as he was trying to, 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 to mention. With all due respect, I think what I was mentioning is that us as a region, as our neighbors, Rwanda is not going to move, DRC is not going to move. We need to find solutions to address the real causes of the problems in DRC. I thank you. Thank you.
Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, in accordance with the terms of paragraph 8 of the resolution just adopted, the 11th emergency special session of the General Assembly is temporarily adjourned. This meeting is adjourned. Thank you.